Welcome to Great Gardens. Today's show is on landscape design. We're going to discuss some basic design elements and we're going to walk around an actual house and uh, with, with a landscape designer in a minute. But before we do that, earlier on, we had a chance to sit down with Lynn Wagner, who went over the basic mechanics of how the landscape design process works. Let's take a look at that. So Lynn, tell us what you do. I'm a landscape designer with the nursery and we do at-home consultations, which means we go out to the homeowner's property, look at it, evaluate it, spend a lot of time with the homeowner, usually up to an hour, um, and decide with, between the two of us what they're interested in having done. Okay. So the call comes in to you, you go out, That's and right. uh, usually the homeowner has a pretty good idea, I would imagine, of what they want to do, but they what do. can you advise homeowners that they should be thinking about? Well, we usually ask first off, what use do you want to have out of this piece of property that you're looking at, whether it's a vegetable garden, a perennial bed, uh, new lawn, landscaped uh, screening, you know, there's so many different uses. Uh, for instance, the plot I'm going to show you, the people wanted a bigger backyard mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted to be able to play soccer out there with their kids. So that was their main use. They also wanted a much larger patio than they had. So that all went into the design process. Right. So usually before somebody calls you, they, pretty, they have a pretty good yes. sense of what they want to do. Hardscaping patios, yeah. the walkways, the walls, that seems to be taking off these days. seems like everybody wants right. more of that space. They want more outdoor space. They want to be able to use their yards more in the summer, which means either, you know, they're getting away from decks, more getting down the patios and outdoor living spaces, mm. which include fireplaces, uh, mm. fire pits sometimes. Outdoor kitchens have become very popular. Um, that's the high end of the hardscape, right. but again, patios and walkways are a lot of what we do. Small walls, right. um, some small garden walls and things like that are right. really popular. And typically, what kind of materials do people uh, say they're most interested in these days? Is it the granite or the, the concrete products or bluestone? It's, all it's of a the above? mix. I really can't say there's one or the other. Of, depending on the location, mm -hmm. sometimes we'll make a recommendation. Um, for instance, this particular house has paver walls already, so these people were interested in a paver patio to match the walls, and that's something we do. And the wall material would be pavers. Um, quite often we'll do stone walls. Uh, very typical for a patio is bluestone because of its regularity. It's, it's nice and flat, so when you put furniture on it, it's very functional. Um, and that we might edge with granite or brick or even pavers. So there's a lot of different materials that we use in that process. Yeah, and I imagine cost is a big factor. Do people have any Huge. idea what it's going to cost before they call you? <laughs> Practically none. Yeah. And there, it's always a little sticker shock at first, but yeah. you know, the materials can average out to be similar. I'm not going to say they're the same. Right. But the most part, it's installation fees, and different materials require different types of installations and preparations. So when somebody calls you up. You got to go look at it. You can't. Absolutely. You can give them a range, probably a pretty broad yeah, range, but yeah. you can't pinpoint the price without no, going No, I can out there. tell them what their materials and installation per square foot might be. It doesn't okay. take into consideration location uh, accessibility, which is huge. Right. I want a patio, but it's on top of that hill. You know right. that kind of thing. The labor you have to, factor is labor huge. huge. Yeah. Right. So that's a lot of the right. reason we go out to people's homes. Right. Um, what. Uh, you mentioned some types of hardscaping. What about the plant material? What do you see as uh, most common these days? Our homeowners looking, I mean, I would imagine you go out to a site and sometimes you have to do some convincing because yeah. you'll look at a yard and you'll say, here's what I would do. Right. And it might be different than what they would think. Exactly. So like screening, that's got to be huge, Screening is right? huge right now. With the amount of uh, construction going on towards Boston, larger houses on smaller plots of land, screenings become huge. Yeah. And it's an issue because there's not a lot of space to put screening material. They want tall. Tall also means usually some width involved, right. but we don't want to give up the backyard. So it becomes a little bit of a, you know, factor. And shade. There's a lot of shade, shade with these small lots and toward the city especially. You get a lot of pine shade, which is dense shade. So that all factors into the plant material that we can recommend. Right. And right. what's available. I mean, sometimes, you know, midsummer we can't get right. a huge plant. That's a good point. Um, because it, you can't dig it in the middle of the summer. It has to be dug in the spring or the fall. A lot of the evergreens we can get year round. So. That's what we're looking at for, for um, screening material, mostly is evergreen. And I know that evergreens and deciduous trees have to be dug around here before mm -hmm. mid-May or even early May. Right. 
So it really pays to think about this what right. you might want to do during February and March so that we can get exactly, exactly what the, the person what, wants. What we see is in the summer people realize they're outdoors on their yard and they now we've said, oh, there's a new house over there we need to screen. So they'll call us and then we'll be ready in the fall again to go and, you and can do some those, those installations. In so that's become really popular. I do a lot of, and I find our department does a lot of installations for screening in the late fall. Right. Which right. is, you know, prepares people for a little bit of Winter. Yeah. They get some green, evergreen in their backyard for yep. winter. And we do mix in a lot of deciduous, too, to give a little more textured balance and, and that type of thing. Right. And so color. screening is huge. And mm -hmm. you might go out to somebody's property, I would imagine, and you would say, let's do the screening first. And before you do that, you got to take down some trees. Exactly. To create more space. So. Yep. Um, now, with plant material in itself, what, what's popular these days? Are people requesting certain things because they read about it? Or do, yeah. you, do you convince them to go one way because it's what you would recommend? I try not to steer them initially. I listen. What do you want? What are you looking for? Someone yesterday told me, oh, I want to have lilacs and peonies. My mother had them. Yeah. But you have a shaded yard. Yeah. So you're not going to have lilacs and peonies unless you take down these trees. Right. So it becomes a conversation. Yeah. A lot of it is listening. What you want, what do you want as the homeowner? What's going to be practical? And what right. we're able to work into your, your situation. Um, as far as what's popular, evergreens in New England always, whether it's uh, shrubs, uh, trees, they want the color all year long. Right. And a lot of that we can mix in with deciduous, like I said, because it gives you a lot of texture balance. Year-round color is always one of your goals. Always. Year-round interest in the Interest, and it could be bark interest, like a birch or a, a paper bark maple mm -hmm. that gives, and I like to bring that to the forefront. So in the winter, you have an evergreen backdrop with nice. something interesting yeah. in the front. Yeah. Let's take a look at one of your plants. Okay. This is what you'll do This first, is what I right? do is I go out and I'll measure the property. This is a really rough field drawing. Mm -hmm. um, and I measure it with, you know, the tools I carry. A lot of it is this, mm -hmm. which is a uh, um, just a measuring wheel measuring for wheel. distances. Um, we get, if we have variations in elevation that we have to contend with, somebody wants a small wall mm -hmm. or you know you have to put steps in again we measure that using other tools right. and when I come back to the office I take the field drawing and I will um, draw up a plan for them okay and usually this size prop plan is is adequate um, and that shows you know trees uh, uh, surrounding trees this happens to be a very steep hillside so okay. the idea was to stabilize these arrows represent the slope these are the slope down so you know this property is coming down into the backyard uh, very steep slope probably a, a 45 degree angle very okay. steep so this has to be stabilized this is the soccer field but the, right now the hill ends right about here okay. so we have to push it back push it that back to create more width. a small wall yeah and it's only a three foot wall if that, it might be two to three feet. Mm -hmm. uh, that creates a nice big yard. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a deck here that's not really usable. It's too small. Okay. And this is a property where they wanted a ground um, uh, 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 surface area that's covered patio. with patio. So the deck will step down. To the a deck patio. will step down. That way, they have free access right to the lawn. Right. And it'd be they have a young family, and they wanted to not have a lot of stairs involved. So, you know, this is the type of thing I would send out to a customer with. A quotation, mm -hmm. um, and that would show the the price of these plants. I don't have one right here. Um, right. Something like this would show a list of the plant material okay. that matches up with what's there, and in so the customer will get the design, get the quotation, get the quotation, and know what the bottom line is. Right. And then they will will get together and go over it and make any changes right. that are make necessary. Right. Make any changes. Stay yep. within their budget. Yep. So the budget is always you want to know Huge. what that is up front. The first thing I tell a customer is think about your use, yep. what you want to do with it and then have a budget in mind so I can work right. within those parameters. Right. I can design an $80,000 job, and they say, well, we really only want to spend five, right. and I've done a lot of work for you know, nothing at that point. Right. And, they're, <laughs> and they're, they're very disappointed because they're not going to get this. Yeah. They're going to yeah. get uh, you know, the shrubs well, and all. Well, they do that in the next phase. Right. And we do yeah. phase things, and that's right. what we're doing with this job. We're phasing, we're doing the patio, and then we'll do the wall on right. the hillside. Set the so, priorities. Yeah. A couple of things, a couple of last questions for you, Lynn. What are the responsibilities that the homeowner has to be prepared for after the installation is done? Maintenance. Maintenance, maintenance. And that includes, especially with shrubs and trees, watering. You know, the first year is critical to get their roots in the ground. We water when we leave, and we leave, and we, we're not there. So the homeowner has to take care of the plants. Right. We leave instructions, written instructions. And I usually review it with the customers right. 
on the day of the installation, right. as does our foreman. It's a so, huge investment. You've got to realize investment. that up front that you've got to be there to take yes. care of have somebody taking yeah. care of You have of to pay attention investment. to the weather. You have to pay attention to um, unusual weather, too much rain, not enough rain, drought. Mm -hmm. We've had both in the last year. Uh, and then you get into the snow and the ice and that kind of thing. Right, right. Okay, so that's very good, Lynn. That's okay. a good overview of what you do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Lynn, that was great. Thanks for showing us how the process works uh, for landscape designers and what you do. We're at a house now, and we're actually going to walk around with Tom Strangfeld, landscape designer with Weston Nurseries, and now we're going to go through the process of what he does when he's on site with a client. So let's go meet Tom. Hi, Tom. Hi, Peter. How are you today? I'm good. Nice day. Nice day. So we're out here at a neighborhood in Hopkinton, and uh, Tom is the landscape designer, and I am, I'm going to play the homeowner, and we're going to walk around. We're going to walk around this house. It's a relatively new neighborhood, and we're going to, uh, uh, you're going to ask me a lot of questions, I understand, and I'm going to give you answers based on what I want to do with this house. Right. Okay. Right. I'll so here to... we are. We're looking at the front, and that's the first thing you usually do? Let me tell you the two things that happen in the front of any house. And so when I pull up um, to anybody's yard, well, I actually do two things. I drive past it, and then I come back the other way, because I'm not sure how they approach it or how mm -hmm. you would approach it. So I want to kind of get the views, because the two things that happen in the front of somebody's house is you look at it from the street when you're going to sell it, when you're buying it, when you drive past, and you drive into the driveway and you park your car and you walk to the front door. Right, right. With, without too many exceptions, that's what goes on in suburban neighborhoods. So I want to kind of get that information first. What I do when I come to a house is I want to find out what's going on with the house. I want to find out the site conditions. I want to find out what the soil is like. But the thing I want to know most is how the person who lives here uses it. Right. All right? So when I come to a new home, I'm, start, I'm like a sponge. I'm starting to gather a lot information. Of right. The minute I get here, I'm gathering information on the site. And then as I meet the people, I want to be quiet, the homeowners. I want to be quiet and I want to ask leading questions. I want to, I want to find out how you, were, how you use the site right now. And at the same time, I'm kind of looking and saying, wow, we could do that over there, we could do this right. over there, because right. I may see things that you don't. Right, right. So, so let's do that. We'll play our role, okay. let's walk around. And this, to me, is always one of the most critical places in the yard. I get out of my car, and everybody says to me, nobody comes to my front door. And usually it's because of the landscape. Right, people All tend right? to walk through the garage doors. So, again, the, the view from the road is important, but this is almost just as important. And this is a little tough in this home, because I can't see the front door. The walk tells me where it is. I'm not going to say this until I have talked to them for a while, but right. I wouldn't even mind seeing this walk pushed out, out a, little a little bit. bit. That makes sense. Yeah. Right? Just to kind of direct it down, maybe even to tie into this bed out here. Mm -hmm. So you're suggesting a big, wide landscape? In the yeah, well, yeah. That? Pull that landscape out somewhat, get some perennials okay. as, a, as, a, as a layer in front of the existing plants right. if they want to keep the existing plants. Again, I don't know any of this because I haven't really met... I've met you, but I haven't right. met the homeowner yet. Right. Well, I'm, I am so, the homeowner, right. so let's keep but going. I, I'm, I'm kind of getting an idea of how the landscape works, but the first, the most important thing is I want to meet them mm -hmm. and then start listening very carefully to what they're telling me. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. All right. You right tell now, me. this has been in about 10 or 15 years. And I feel like it's a little bit overgrown, and you're right. I feel like you can't see the front door. Right. I agree with that. Okay. So what should I do? Do you think I should show the house a little more? Should this be rejuvenated? You look at, you look at this from the street and what happens, you've got a very large, attractive facade. It's white with these black bands and then you've got these little green masses coming up around it. There mm -hmm. really should be a more solid horizontal. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's almost too much detail for the first meeting. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is that you're a little troubled by the foundation. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And then as we walk around the rest of the house, I want to see how you use that because the design part comes in when I sit and I study this for a while and I really decide what has to what has to go and then I put it down on paper and I show it to you and you say, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, okay. Right. Well, right now I say this is a little bit mature okay. and I'd like to see some rejuvenation. Right. I like your idea of bumping the walk out to see the door let sooner. Me, let me see what the front door feels like. Okay, let's go over there. Tom, I just feel like, again, this is a little mature, a little overgrown. I have to prune things back and it's beginning to take on this manicured look that I don't really care for here. And yet, it's not really that overgrown over here. The roadies are still nice. Need to come out of the winter a little bit. But, you know, I might like to see this 
juniper possibly taken out, but what I'd really like to do is layer some perennials all through here. I like so that, that we had in the springtime and summertime, we had a secondary layer coming up and we had some color. Yeah, I like that, because this is starting to look a little woody as you prune it back so heavily every year. That, that's meant to creep and have feathery edges yeah. and it's tough to keep. The Kusa dog was really nice. I love look the Look at the buds on that. Yeah. You know, one of the neat things about Kusa that it works here is Kusa flowers are born upright. Yeah. So when you look at them, if you're above them, it really is pretty yeah, looking down the, the top of the flowers. Yeah. That's true. How's this, how do you feel about this view to the neighbors? Well, let's go look at that next because I right. think I want to do some screening over there. Okay, so here we are in my side yard. And what I have to say about this is it's just a big, blank, open slate. What I want to say is what do I do about this? What would you do about this? I'd start asking you a bunch of questions. First thing is where's your leech field? Because we okay. don't want to plant a bunch of trees on top of your right. leech field. Right, and it's right in the middle of the lawn money. here, so we don't have to worry second, about that. Second, are the kids done playing out here now, so the second, third, and first base are not going to be used Their anymore? Their kids are getting older now, All so right. yeah, I think so we're it's not a ball that. feed so much anymore. Third will be how much privacy. It looks like we've got flags down there. It's probably the property That's the neighbor's line. dog fence, actually, so it is the property right. line. How much, prop how much privacy do you want from... The neighbors, nice I, house next door, but how yeah. much privacy do you need? Well, do you I want? think when we get to the backyard, we want to do some things back there, so I do want some privacy ultimately because okay. we're going to be spending more time in the backyard. Okay, well, you're probably talking about here in, in side yards and big open spaces is big trees, big plants, you evergreens. Want evergreens, right? you want shade yeah. trees, and this is important because the stuff that we usually do around the house, the planting, that tends to last, in my experience, I'd say 20, 25 years. Okay. All right. When you plant trees, it could be for a hundred, be here for a hundred so years. So make the right so decisions. So you make it, you do it right. Full sun location, does that give Full you a bunch of options? Full sun's fine, as long as I know there's no leech field out here, I want to look at the view from the deck okay. in the back, want to get a good sense of that, and then I'll just start popping trees into different places, thinking about them. Let's make our way to the backyard. Okay. All right, so now we're coming to the backyard, which Tom, I know this is the most exciting part because there's so many possibilities back here. And we're going to talk in real generalities versus specifics because it's all about how much you can afford, how much you want to spend, your budget, and doing it over time, right? Yes. This, this is where it gets really interesting and different for every different family. Yeah. Uh, what I have to do when I'm out in, into a backyard is I really have to find out about how you use it, how your family uses it, what you, you know, what's going to go on in the future. Do you want to put a swimming pool in? So this is really, when I get in somebody's backyard, I want to ask them questions. Right. How much time do they spend up on the deck? What time of day are they up on the deck? Does the view looking into either side bother them a little bit? What's, what's this flat area like over here? Is this a hockey rink with a fire pit in the center of it? And what's with the batting cage? Is that going to be a golf cage? So I'm going to find out as much about your lifestyle as I can here because what I can do for people is I can take wishes that they have kind of vague, ambiguous wishes and I can transform them into solid forms right. that then we can put a budget on right. and then we can figure the whole thing so out. So I sit out right? here, the sun's in my eyes, okay, let's put a big tree right there that's not going to get too big, that I'm, kind of thing, I'm, right? right? I'm going to look at, from being up there, I'm going to look at the view to the neighbor's house and I might place one tree that gives you and your neighbor both privacy. Mm. The other thing you can do up here, you know those old-fashioned clothes dryers, <laughs> yeah. aluminum pole yeah. with the wire coming off them and the strings? You get about two or three of them up there and you start hanging your laundry out and yeah. placing all your neighbors will put up evergreens and fences and you won't have to spend any money and you'll that's, be blocked out completely. That's a low budget route. I like that one. But, you know, this, again, this is just really all about how you want to use the backyard. Right, right. Okay. So, so maybe, okay, I just did my basement. I want to come out I onto saw that. a... Yeah, I saw that. I come out onto a patio. Or I may like this fire pit and I want that in the middle of the patio with the big tree to block the sun so I can also... Or I may want to come down off the porch onto the patio. Once you... Once I find out those things about the property and how you want to use it, then it's my job to kind of connect that uh, set of stairs coming out of the basement to whatever else is happening okay. here. Okay. But again, I'm going to be guided by you. I'm going to ask, how do you see that? How right. do you see that walk, that patio? So think about that before your designer comes out. Think about All those right? things first. Right. So, have a, so yeah. when they know, you know, I mean, don't be intimidated by it. Right. Don't think you have to design it, but you're the one that's going to use it. But it's also this. okay not to know much and just ask a lot of questions because that's what yeah, you said. Yeah, go, it goes both yeah. ways. It okay. goes, sometimes people, sometimes I do all the talking. Yeah. But usually I'm trying to do all the listening. That's good. All right. All right. Let's go over to the side okay. yard where we started and we'll sum it all up. Well, Tom, that was great. We just walked around the whole house and you gave me a lot of things to think about. The question is, as a homeowner, what do I do next? I think you want to start in the front. That seems to be your first priority. I so do. So you kind of got to make that decision. We'll hold off. I do want to start in the we'll front. Start, yeah, the back is a we'll big dollar the, thing. I need we'll to think about that. But the front, I know I want to. What happens then is I measure the front up, 
I kind of make suggestions to where the walk goes. But here's what you need to do specifically, because you've kind of pointed me in the right direction now. But now I need to find out what you like, what okay. your wife likes in terms of plant material. There's a lot of ways to do that. The first thing I would do is ride around your neighborhood. Okay. And when you see a landscape that you really like, just write down the number of the house. So when I come back to visit you next time, or you can call me up or email me, I want to go around to those. I'm going to look at them. I'm going to see the way they prune. I'm going to see the different types of plants they use, and I'm going to get some idea of your style okay. and your taste. That makes right? sense. Yeah. That's very valuable to me. The other thing I like people to do is go to a garden center, and this can be dangerous, mm -hmm. but go to a garden center, and within reason, don't write down 500 plants for me, <laughs> but walk around the garden center. When you see a plant that, oh, I like that, jot that name jot down. Jot that down, right? okay. Because right away then, I'm going to get a better sense of what your personal taste is. Right. Right. Same with driving around. You could probably do that you online, can, too. You can also do it online. Go to the different plant libraries. If you enter just the name of a plant that you found at a garden center and hit mm -hmm. images, you'll see all kinds of images, and you get right. all the information. See what it looks like when it's that. mature, perhaps. So you do that, which focuses down a little bit. Think about your budget. All right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, if somebody came back to you and said, it's going to cost you 5000 it's going to cost you 10000 it's going to cost you twenty. At some point, you're going to say to me, well, stop there. Yeah, right, right. right. So be thinking in those terms because okay. it's very, the landscape is very flexible. But the you'd also be able to give me a general sense if I wanted give to do the walkway and the plant. I'll give you a very specific estimates. Yeah, specific right. estimates. Okay. Exactly. But that's the best thing to do. Just find out what, what you think you like. Let me do my part of it, which is make suggestions to changes of walks. And changes right, and you'll actually plants. produce a design. We produce a design, as I think you talked about with Lynn. Right. Uh, you saw the mechanics of that. Yeah, yeah. And then see how, all, how it all unfolds. Great. And be patient with designers, because in the spring, we make <laughs> far more promises than we can keep. I'm telling people, yeah, yeah, I'll have that design for you in two or three weeks. Right, and right, three right. or four weeks later, I'm going, oh, no, I haven't. So patience. Yeah. We'll don't, be, don't be afraid to rattle our cages, but be Mid, patient. The, the midwinter is the best time to get to Yeah, it really is. Probably, right? You know, as long as there's not too much snow on the ground. Right. Well, Thank Tom, you it's been me out. very good. Very been helpful. Thank you very much. Take care of here. Okay. Now let's go back to the garden center and meet with Ann Wells for Did You Know? Hi, I thought I would talk today about what it means when we say that a plant is dormant and when it breaks dormancy. Uh, something that you hear all the time if you go to a nursery or you're talking to somebody about plant problems. So dormant actually comes from the Latin, means to sleep, and uh, a plant is still alive but not actively growing. That's the basic definition. So think of it as sleeping. Uh, plants need to go dormant in response to either predictable or sometimes unpredictable stresses in their environment. That might be a big change in light, a big change in soil moisture or a big change in temperature. And it's a survival strategy for plants. So here in the north, especially the big stressor that plants try to avoid is the winter. And hence we have winter dormant plants that now are beginning to break dormancy. I think one of the ones that we're most familiar with as New Englanders is the idea that uh, the fall color in our trees, that means that deciduous trees, they're putting down incredible energy stores and carbohydrates in their roots and now they have no use for those leaves. They're a liability during the winter, so they shut them off. They turn beautiful colors in the process. They cast them off, and then they stand there bare all winter. This way they protect themselves from the winter cold, drying winds, and lack of available water once the ground freezes. When the ground freezes, a plant can't pull water up through its roots. Another good example is evergreens. Um, for us in New England, big difference here. They don't drop all their needles in the winter, but they do go very, very, very quiet. Their metabolic rates slow to almost nothing. But they too break dormancy. I have an example here of something we don't often think of as an evergreen. This is a broadleaf evergreen. This is Vinca minor. This stays all winter, barely eking along, barely breathing, barely drinking, barely eating. It doesn't do much, but Look, here comes the brand new growth, tiny little new green leaves. These are being produced by using stores of energy that were laid down in the roots of this plant over the winter. And then once this leaf begins, this set of leaves begins to open up nice and big and broad, then the plant can start fending for itself again. And it will replace those energy stores. It'll have all new leaves that will conduct photosynthesis for it. So broadleaf evergreens, even though they keep those leaves out there, they are dormant. It's when you see new growth that you know that they're breaking dormancy for real. And that's usually in response for all of these plants to rising soil temperatures. That first and foremost in New England says spring is on its way. Perennials, 
instead of leaving a structure above ground like a shrub, um, perennials die all the way back to the ground. They lose their tops. These are herbaceous perennials. This is a peony, and you can see here, no green top growth. The roots are alive. This one is just beginning to wake up. It's growing these new sprouts. For some of these, they've gotten quite large. These are the bigger roots that are producing more top growth. And yet, for the tiniest roots in here, you can barely see little nubbins of new growth popping up. So even within one plant, there can be various rates of breaking dormancy or awakening, using those reserved energy stores in the roots to produce new top growth. Shrubs and trees, deciduous ones, begin to have little buds that are swelling. You can see the balls get bigger every day. It's a wonderful thing to watch. Sometimes you get real color. If you look at right now, maple trees, they're bright red with those emerging leaf and flower buds. And probably our most remarkable one in the spring, and the one that brings smiles to the face of most New Englanders, are spring bulbs. Bulbs are a packet of energy. This happens to be a summer bulb, um, but fall bulbs aren't available right now. So same idea. This started as a bulb, a packet of energy, alive but not actively growing. Soil temperatures rise, moisture becomes available, and then you get something beautiful like this, the top growth. We all know that this in turn, this is a grape hyacinth, that this will go dormant. Again, as soon as all this foli foliage ripens off, feeds the bulb, and then we won't see it again until next spring. So it's possible to be dormant in the winter and to be dormant in the summer. Another good example of that is perennial peonies. And they will die back, especially in hot weather, to nothing, but they'll come again next year. So that's dormancy. Happy spring. Thank you, Anne. Great information as always. I hope you enjoyed the show. I certainly learned a lot, like I always do, about how the landscape design process works from behind the scenes when we do the drawings or drop the, uh, the estimate for the job to the actual client process where you walk around the house. And certainly listening is a key part with any good landscape designer, but also knowing what you like too. And I thought it was a good suggestion to go see houses in the neighborhood, your local independent garden center on plants you might like, or an online plant library. So, great show today. If you have any topics you want us to cover in the future, please email us, and we'll see you next time on Great Gardens.